Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head over to Canada once again and we're going to have a look at a beer from another brewery that I've never tried anything from before. So these guys are yet another relatively new addition to the Canadian beer scene. Despite their short existence though, they've built a very good reputation for themselves. They've been very experimental and also very prolific at the same time. And I think it probably is fair to say that they've become best known for their different kinds of sour beers and wild ales and stuff like that although they do have a number of regular beers in their core range and you know that are brewed kind of experimentally as well but a very interesting brewery from what I can gather and the beer that we're going to have a look at today is one that should be very quirky as well this is a sub style that I've only reviewed on the channel a couple of times before I've only had maybe one or two of them beyond that actually so it takes a little bit of time to get used to this style but you know if they're done well they can be very very nice so needless to say I'm very curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us. It is supposed to be a very nice beer so hopefully that turns out to be true. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review and as always I hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well. So uh, yeah for this review then we are going to head to Toronto in Ontario and we're going to have a look at my first beer then from Burdock Brewery. So this particular beer is called Gran Bino. It comes in at 9% ABV and this one is being described as a cherry stout. But yeah, I guess we could also term this one as a sour stout or a wild stout or something like that. But this beer has been aged in Cabernet Franc wine barrels, a red wine barrel, and it's also uh, using some uh, Montmorency cherries as well from France, I believe. So yeah, this should be a very interesting one. I haven't reviewed a sour stout in a very long time actually and for in fact one of the last ones I can remember reviewing was the Raspy Engine from um, Harveston Brewery back home in the motherland of Scotland. But this is another beer that I picked up at Craft Beer Base Mother Tree in Umeda in Osaka here in Japan and you know they've got a good selection of Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, American, New World beers if we can call them that in addition to some really nice Japanese stuff as well as a fridge full of like old school Belgian sours and stuff like that. So definitely a venue you want to hit up if you find yourself here in Japan and uh, yeah this is just a beer that I thought sounded quite interesting and there was only one bottle left as well which kind of prompted me to go for it. So uh, yeah this should be quite interesting. Let's crack on with this one then and see what it's all about. So as always with my reviews I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that hopefully I can do in the future from Burdock Brewery. This is the very first time I'm trying one of their beers as I mentioned, but there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you give is massively appreciated. Remember, you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer based on the geography tagging system. So just go into the homepage, use the search bar, put your hometown, state, county, province, prefecture, whatever you like in there. If I've reviewed beers from the area that you search for, they will pop up. Failing that though, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries. You'll find this one in the Canadian playlist along with a number of other things. And you can of course check out the playlist of beers from other countries as well. But I'm hoping I can add to the Canadian list a little bit more as time goes on. And if you want to learn more about Canadian beer, do check out my Canadian beer tubing colleagues. Lee Russell is one of the really OG craft beer reviewers on YouTube. So I'll try to remember to put the link to his channel in the video description below. But let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you a wee bit about Burdock Brewery then. So, Burdock Brewery, as I've mentioned to you already, are based in Toronto in Ontario, and the company was founded back in 2015 by Jason Stein and Matthew Park. So, Matt is originally from BC in Western Canada, and he was previously a, a firefighter, but was also an avid home brewer, whereas Jason has a background in music. But the two wanted to combine their passions by fusing a music venue together with a microbrewery, and so that's what they did. So, they found a location on Bloor Street, which has a music venue, a microbrewery, brewery and a restaurant in one and they recruited Siobhan McPherson to assist them in the brewing and she used to brew with Amsterdam Brewery and Mill Street Brew Pub and the first beers were released from Burdock Brewery in August of 2015. But after starting the brewery they started to delve into the world of wine and they created a wine program for the restaurant which led to them building relationships with different wineries and aging a number of beers with grape skins and using barrels and stuff like this. And um, yeah, as a result, these guys have become very well known for their sour beers and wild ales over the years and being a kind of more funky brewery. 
Uh, but in early 2023, they opened a new production brewery with a retail space in the Kensington Market area of the city. And this brewery is in the old Sassmark building and it, allow, it will allow them to ramp up their production quite significantly. And one of the big things is that they'll have laggers year round, which they never used to have before. Apparently it was quite difficult for them to produce laggers during the summer and things like this because they just ran out very quickly and they take a long time to make. But the smaller brewery at the Bloor Street location will be used mainly for recipe development going forward. That is quite a small one with only like 800 square feet of space from what I understand. So the new brewery is going to give them a lot more space to ferment and do things as we said and have a bigger barrel program. But the brewery name Burdock is taken from the roots that once used to be used in brewing and they're also a liver stimulant as well apparently which they thought was quite funny and quite ironic but the use of this name is also a nod to Matt's interest in plants. But like I said over the years these guys have become very well known for their more kind of sour and funky beers but they do some regular things as well and as of April 2023 when I'm filming this review for you these guys have produced around 300 different kinds of beer according to Untapped. But uh, yeah, that is everything I can really tell you about Burdock Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys though, you can check out the brewery website, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on, and you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all of the different beers that these guys have done. So um, yeah, let's go on and actually have a little look at this beer itself. So as we said earlier, this one comes in at 9% ABV, it's an imperial cherry stout, I guess we could call it, aged in Cabernet Franc barrels with Mont, uh, Montmorency, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, cherries. So um, yeah, should be quite interesting. This is a 375ml bottle, incidentally, it's kind of classic Belgian sort of presentation, this one, a plain gold uh, bottle cap on this one. It just says on the side on the side here, yeah, Imperial Stout with sour cherries aged one year in freshly emptied Cabernet Franc wine barrels. So um, yeah, should be nice. This one contains a little bit of wheat and oats. We should point that out as well. So we should get some nice smoothness in the malt base with this beer. But yeah, very simple artwork. There you can see Burdock Brewery on the front. And uh, if memory serves me correctly, I think I paid about seventeen hundred. Japanese yen for this bottle. So that's going to translate to what? Maybe about, um, yeah, I think that's going to translate to something like 12 euros, uh, 120 Swedish kroner for those of you watching back in Sweden. Um, uh, I guess about, yeah, 11 pounds sterling and maybe about 13, 14 dollars American, something like that. I'm not sure what the Canadian exchange rate is with the yen at the moment, unfortunately. But as we said, 9%. Um, wine barrel aged imperial stout with sour cherries added into it. This should be quite nice and a very interesting introduction to Burdock Brewery. So let's get this guy out into the glass and see what it's all about. Yeah, nice little bit of smoke on the opening as we get the beer out. But let's get this guy into the glass and see how we get on. So, yeah, this looks pretty good, I have to say, and pretty much as you would expect from any kind of stout, be it imperial, milk stout, whatever. Um, yeah, this does look pretty nice, I have to say. So, um, yeah, before the head disappears on this one then, you can see that it's poured with about a, somewhere between a third and a half finger of a frothy, I would say kind of medium tan head, but you can see a little bit, if you look at the colour of this, you can see that the head has almost been stained a little bit by the uh, by the cherry, so I think that is pretty cool. I'm just going to turn off the computer screen to get the nice light again, but um, yeah, this does look pretty damn good, I have to say. One or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there, but you can see that head has faded away to be a very thin kind of foamy layer with a kind of richer thickness, just a richer ring around the edge of the glass, but it looks very nice. In terms of the colour of this beer, as I'm sure you can see, it's a lovely dark ebony rosewood, and remember the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use, this goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role, because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised, and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any barrelation that you do or adjuncts you put in will affect the colour of the beer as well. When it comes to dark beers like this though, especially black beers I should say, 
specifically, it's very difficult to affect the colour of these beers by adding in adjuncts. The only time I've seen that done was in a beer from uh, Puasta in Tartu in Estonia. They put beets in it and it had this kind of purple edge to it. But yeah, even the cherries used in this one, I'm sure, uh, I don't think they will affect the colour of the beer that much, but you can certainly see their influence on the head. When we shine the, right, the light through this beer, though, you can see it's got a little bit of a kind of reddish tint to it, in fairness. But uh, yeah, it's got that kind of ebony rosewood colour and a wee bit of a kind of Coca-Cola, Pepsi coloured edge that we often expect from this style. But yeah, I don't think we really need to say anything else about the appearance of this one, to be honest with you. It is, as you would expect, from pretty much any Imperial Stout. So let's have a wee look at the aroma of this one then and see what it's all about. This should be really interesting. Oh, yeah. Now, that's really interesting. This, this aroma is really quite balanced, actually. Um, you've got a mix of like a very smooth stout underneath there, but a lot of fruity juiciness and just a little bit of vinous quality. I have to admit, I was expecting something a lot more kind of sharp and punchy, so we'll need to see how that kind of transpires in the flavour. But yeah, the, the way this beer goes together is really not what I expected. Lovely juicy fruitiness to it, big smooth imperial stout underneath that, and then just you know, the juicy grapey notes going further into the aftertaste. So uh, yeah, I like this. I really like how this goes together. Uh, Aroma-wise, it's a big thumbs up for me, but let's try and break it down for you and just describe it that wee bit more uh, in depth. So the, um, the backbone of the beer, I have to say, is for me, it's got a lovely kind of roasty, toasty, a um, little bit of bread crust in there, but you can certainly smell um, the oak wood in this one. You can smell that lovely wood from the oak barrel in there, and it's actually a very smooth oak that you get out of this one, so I'd be very curious to know whether it's American oak, but Cabernet Franc, I'm not sure, I'm guessing it's from France with that name, but yeah, um, normally you would expect European oak to be a little bit drier and than the American oak. For me, that's a key difference. European oak is always a little bit drier, whereas American oak is a little bit smoother and gives you a wee bit more vanilla, I think. But yeah, the oaky characters on the backbone of this beer are very, very smooth, but the presence of oats and wheat in there could be assisting with that. But on top of that, you're getting a little touch of vanilla in there. Yes, yeah, so a little touch of vanilla, a um, little bit of woodiness, a little bit of, yeah, so... You've got the big kind of smooth oaky character in there, the little bit of vanilla, and then above that you start to get some of the kind of bready notes from the, the stout itself. So you can feel there's a little bit of a kind of brown bready bread crust in there, sweet brown bread, a little bit of white bread as well. Yeah, brown bread, white bread, a little bit of bread crust, sweet woody kind of things. Um, yeah, the way that that goes together, I think, is really, really nice. Um, yeah, as I say, this is, for me, this is just a really unusual aroma that you get out of this beer. The woodiness is really prominent in this one. The cherries, I don't find the cherries overly sour in the aroma, I have to say. But yeah, um, beyond that, you've got little elements of, um, there's like a little bit of a milky chocolate to this one. But the chocolate isn't really that prominent in this one. I'm getting a lot of kind of toffee and it's like a cream strawberry almost that comes out of this beer. So yeah, for me, it's, it's, it, I love the aroma of this, but I've just certainly, in 3,700 odd reviews, I don't think I've come across an aroma quite like this before. So that's a positive sign for Burdock. It makes me want to try more of their stuff. But yeah, above the kind of brown bready notes, there's like a... There's a little bit of an almost like toffee sweetness. There's a little bit of biscuit. You've got the vanilla under there. Yeah, you've got the vanilla and the, um, yeah, you've got the vanilla and the kind of like strawberry cream type note to it. A little bit of toasty and leathery brown sugar in there as well, actually. So yeah, the way everything kind of pieces together in this beer for me is, is really interesting. The malty and yeasty side of this beer is is really quite something else. A little bit of honeycomb and nutty character coming out of it as well, the more that you smell of it. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, hoppy character and stuff like that then, I think we've picked out everything we really can 
from the malty side of the beer. For me, there is a little bit of hoppiness to this one. There's a wee touch of earthiness in there, a little bit of herbal character. You do get a quite a bit of grassiness out of this one as well. Um, one of the things with beers like this, there is a bit of a debate I mean, about how um, much hop to use and how exactly you hop these beers. Because with the old school, more Belgian sour type beers, of course, what they used to do was use older hops that had lost a little bit of their alpha acid potency. And um, yeah, that's, that's the kind of mentality a lot of Lambic brewers adopt. But yeah, with more modern sour beers, some brewers don't want to use hops at all. Some brewers um, do something between, uh, you know, straight up dry hopping and using older hops. You've got a whole mix of things going on. But for me, this beer definitely has a little bit of an almost kind of noble hop character to it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit of like Bramlin's Cross or uh, Northern Brewer that's been used in this one. There are other hops there. I forget what the one from... Uh, there's a lovely hop from uh, from the east of France which gives you a strawberry character. And it wouldn't be surprising if, if that... For me, at least, it wouldn't be surprising if that hop was in here. Um, Barbe Rouge, I think it's called, if I remember correctly. It's a beautiful hop that gives you um, just, just lovely, juicy red fruity notes. So, yeah, um, the, the grassy... This beer, for me, it has got a little bit of an almost noble character to it but a wee bit of a herbal earthiness as well but I'd be tempted I'd be more tempted to say it was Northern Brewer potentially the French Bar Bruges but you know an outside bet would potentially be um, English Bramling's Cross but yeah the green point on this one wet grassiness a little bit of floral note wee bit of herbal and earthy character and yeah the way it goes together I think is, is really quite interesting on the fruity side of things then let's have, see if we can pick out the, the, the fruit from the hops as well but um, yeah, the for me, underneath what is quite obviously the cherry character, there is a little bit of a kind of oily fig. There's a bit of black currant and a wee bit of black berry as well. But um, yeah, all of these notes go together in a really quite uh, in a really quite interesting way. Um, and on top of that. Um, within the fruit, it almost just has this vanilla, like strawberry cream kind of thing. I'm getting a lot of kind of candied strawberry out of the aroma of this beer. But then on top of that, of course, it takes your nose a little bit of time to just adjust to it. You can smell a little bit of a kind of leathery tannin, and then you get the, the juicy sour cherries coming out of it. But the, the, I have to say, the aroma, within the aroma, the cherries don't smell overly sharp. They actually smell quite soft and juicy, to be honest with you. So, yeah, I'm really not sure what we're going to get out of this beer, but I'm certainly very, um, both a little bit confused and very curious, having smelled the aroma of this one. So, as I always say, take a wee bit of time to just enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it, but I think it is about time that we taste this one and see what it's all about. So, yeah, this one is the Grand Bino, my first beer from Burdock Brewery in Toronto, Ontario, over in Canada. Uh, I guess a wild stout, a sour stout, a fruit stout, whatever you want to say, from uh, uh, 9% ABV. This should be quite interesting. Slange it, skull, cheers. Ooh. Now that is pretty interesting, I have to say. Um, yeah, this is definitely a sipper, this one. Um, it's one of these beers that is going to test your palate. And like I say, these kind of more sour, wild and funky stouts, fruited stouts, they, you do just have to sip on them a little bit and see what they're trying to do. Um, whether this is a style that's going to catch on a wee bit more or, some, or whatever, I'm not 100% sure. But personally, I find them really to be really interesting beers. Um, and this one, yeah, the, what I'm getting out of this in the in the beginning, it was quite wet and really leaning towards the cherries. And progressively, you're getting more and more roastiness and dryness and stuff out of this and a wee bit more hoppy character as well. And as I've always said, for me, a good sour beer or wild ale or whatever you want to term it, um, it's always about the transition to make from having that big sour impact to just mellowing you out and showing you the smoother and softer flavours. And yeah, this one again does it very nicely. So it's a very well made beer, you can tell that from it. But yeah, the actual flavour profile of this one is not the most 
normal thing, if we can call it that. It's, it is, but it is very nice and it is quite interesting. So let's just try and break this beer down for you and describe it a wee bit more in depth, actually. But I will say, when you take after you take your first few sips and kind of get over it, it mellow. It does mellow out really nicely. Uh, and you start to get more of the flavours that you would have expected based on the aroma. But yeah, let's break this beer down. Middle third of your palate then, you can feel that lovely little bit of woody backbone to this one. And I will say the woody character in this beer is a lot, um, it's a lot drier than the aroma would have you believe. But you do still get an element of smoothness out of it. Um, so yeah, you can feel that slightly drier oaky barrel in there and it, you know, based on the flavours you have in that, it, it fe tastes a little bit more like European oak rather than American oak, although it smells more like American oak, which is interesting. So yeah, you've got that drier, oaky barrel note in there. Further forward on that middle third of your palate, you get more of a kind of butter candy, butterscotchy note, and also a wee bit of a vanilla type quality, but you can feel a little bit of the, the kind of wine on the barrel just sitting above that. Um, so yeah, the the, the barrel age side of this beer is really quite quirky and interesting. So, on the on the actual malty side of things. So if we go above that, you do get a little bit. You get a little bit of that roasty, toasty, slightly dry, well fired bread crust coming out of the beer. So yeah, the way that that goes together for me is also really quite interesting. You have got this balance in the beer between all these things, the smoothness, the roastiness, the sweetness, and also the kind of sour side of the beer. So yeah, above that you've got a roasty, toasty, slightly well-fired bread crust. You've almost got like a little bit of a kind of sweet, kind of brown sugar sponge cakey layer sitting above that. Then you start to get like a more wholemeal, brown bready layer, and maybe a little touch of white bread above that you can see I think the white bread is most likely to come from the wheat and the wheat for me is acting very much like a smoothening agent in this beer and I do wonder how much of the kind of smooth the, the kind of smooth creamy sweetness that this beer has is down to the oats it's probably very likely that it's down to that actually um, so yeah you can feel you've you've got quite a few layers on this like a toasty well fired bread crust like an almost kind of brown sugary sponge cake layer wholemeal brown bread white bread little bit of wheat and then the kind of oaty smoothness and then above the oats you start to get the kind of sweeter sides of the stout I would say. So yeah, in the dead centre in the dead centre of your um, in the dead centre of your palate you'll feel there's a little bit of a straight up almost sweet caramel in there but as you move further out from that it becomes more and more like Werther's original toffee like and maybe you just get a tiny little hint of biscuit out of this one but I'd say it's more Werther's original and, and kind of um, biscuit like but further back on that middle third of your palate there's a little bit of a drier kind of cocoa nibby type quality coming out of the beer as well so um, yeah the way that it goes together in that sense I think is really really nice Yeah, you do get a little touch of nuttiness out of this beer the further into the aftertaste that you go and you can just feel like above and it's an influence of the cherries and for me above that middle third of the palate that we've just described it just feels like there's this kind of wet um, kind of cream cherry or cream strawberry type thing actually just blanketing everything we've talked about but you get more of the roasty dryness just pushing its way out uh, the further forward you go so yeah I like that with this one um, that's the middle third of the palate covered but yeah border region between middle and back third of your palate you get a nice little bit of a kind of bready build up and there's almost like a slightly rye bready and dry rye bready character at that in that border region but the back third of your palate has something similar so as I've always said um, sweeter flavours come out further forward on the palate for me more roasty and toasty and dry flavours come out further back so you can feel that there, uh, there's that nice, the, the woody character is a little bit drier 
and then above that there's a little bit more of a how is it there's a little bit more of a kind of um you do get a little bit of the spirit, the wine spirit, and it feels like a little bit drier, but then, again, you get the roasty, toasty, well-fired bread crust. That's even drier and more roasty. Then you've got the kind of cakey layer, which feels a little bit more, it's like a kind of brandy soap bread, maybe, rather than sponge cake, but yeah, like a brandy soap, sponge cake, brandy soap bread. You can feel that there. That layer is a little bit taller and more airy. Then you've got the wholemeal brown bread layer, which, again, is taller and more airy, and then you can feel the more dense and smooth wheat just sitting above that and then above everything else you get some of the more kind of yeasty qualities out of the beer and it's like a um, kind of farmhousey and sweet and woody bread that you get out of it so that just sits above everything you've got a little bit of honeycomb character in there but yeah like a sort of farmhousey kind of bready character um, but yeah definitely the back third of the palate you can feel the flavour is taller then as you come further forward into the middle third of the palate, it just condenses down and squashes together that little bit more. So yeah, the, the way the malty and yeasty side of this beer goes together is really um, is really interesting. Let's um, have a wee look at the hoppy side of this beer then. I'm just going to check this beer. It does have hops in it. I'm pretty sure it said it did, yeah. So yeah, I think this one, just going by the way it is, I think they've maybe used um, a little bit of old hop in this one because it does have a wee bit of that kind of herbally earthy character, but I think they will have used some kind of fresh hops in the beer as well. So yeah, for me, the if you start in the back corners of the palate, you've got a little bit of earthiness there, and as you move further forward, it gets progressively more kind of herbal, but as you push further forward on the palate, you, some of the earthiness and herbal character just does carry forward. Then you've got a bit of that more floral, aromatic sort of thing uh, coming out of the beer. But it's not too pungent, I would say. Around the front curve of the palate, it's a wee bit lighter and a wee bit more kind of um, grassy, I would say. A little bit more kind of oily. But yeah, the way it goes together, I think, is um, is pretty damn nice. So yeah, the, the hoppy side of this beer just adds a wee bit more complexity to it. And the kind of earthy and herbal notes that it has builds a good bridge with the kind of more roasty... Um, side of the, the cakiness in the beer so yeah that works on the uh, on the rest of the flavours then that we're getting out of this um, yeah I think the um, as we go further forward on that if we go to that front third of your palate we'll look there but the border region between front third and middle third, part, third of your palate you get a little bit of kind of bready build up in there it's almost like a kind of rye bready character again but the base of the front third of your palate there's a bit of the woodiness there a little touch of the wine spirit the roasty kind of well fired bread crust and then a sweet kind of layer of rye bread and then you get that nice oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters roll the way out of the beer but obviously on that front third of your palate as well you're getting the kind of sour impact out of this beer so let's try and break those down for you first off So yeah, when you take this beer in, you will notice that you have a little bit on the very, just behind the very front tip of your tongue, behind the kind of grassy esters, you can feel that you get a little bit of that tanniny kind of sourness out of the beer. And that's obviously kind of, it's kind of from the cherries. But the cherries in this one are quite well rounded and very smooth actually, and almost a little touch leathery. So yeah, I'm finding the further into the aftertaste you go on the front half, of the palate, you're going to notice a gradually leathery, a gradually more and more leathery kind of property coming out of this one. So yeah, you can feel the sharp cherry impact there. When it comes in, it just mellows out very quickly and gives you this leathery flavour, and it's almost got a wee bit of brown sugar to it as well, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, as I say, above the kind of brown bready layer in that front third of your palate, you've got that leathery note, and then the fruity notes that sit in behind that are quite interesting too. So at the back of that front third of your palate, you have this kind of, there's a little bit of an almost kind of pruny note to it. There's some sultanas in there, you know, dried white green grapes. So yeah, I think that is nice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's a wee bit of a, ra in fairness, I would go as far as saying there's a bit of raisiny sharpness in there, a bit of juicy plum 
the prunes underneath the sultanas, as you move further forward into the middle of, thir of that front third of your palette, you get a wee bit more of like a, a kind of juicy figgy character out of it. But then as you move into the front half of that front third of your palette, there's a bit of blackberry, a bit of black currant, I would say, and then blackberry sitting on top of it. And then you have all this stuff from the sour cherries coming out of the beer. I don't find this beer overly sour, though. I actually think the cherries are quite juicy. But, you know, as I say, it, your, your perception of things always changes the more you explore style. And I have been exploring more and more of the kind of sour beers and wild ales in recent times, to be honest with you. Uh, and I don't find, maybe if you're trying this one, as like your first sour beer ever, you would find it very, very sour. But I think the cherries are actually nice and juicy in this one, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, kind of dark cherries as well, though, but potentially that's just the kind of chocolatey character that you're getting out of the beer. So, um, yeah, I will say where I was picking out, the other thing I would say about this beer is that where I was picking out co um, cocoa nibs, at the back of that middle third of your palate, it's actually got a little bit more of a kind of 60-ish, 70% cocoa dark chocolate to it. So, yeah, lots and lots of interesting things going on in this beer, I have to say. Um, like, I, like I said earlier, this is a beer that will take you a little bit of time to kind of understand and to get, but I think it's really nicely done, and this one certainly makes me want to try more from this brewery actually and that's always a positive sign so yeah i think we can leave it at that for the the actual tasting of this beer we can have a wee look at the mouthfeel just to round off the review so for me this beer it's i would say that it's kind of right in the middle of the spectrum mid-bodied Carbonation is quite smooth. It's got a lovely little bit of wetness to it, this one. Very smooth, as I say, very, very smooth. A um, little bit of slickness in there as well. Um, and it's not madly sour. You've got a little bit of the impact sour in this one, which, as I say, comes, it comes from behind just the front tip of your tongue. You can feel those cherries coming in. They come in a little bit sharp, and they just mellow out. And you start to get those kind of leathery flavours in there behind the grassy tip of your tongue. Um, so yeah, lovely oily fruity flavours in this one, a little bit of red fruity sharpness, a wee bit of dryness in there, a little bit of leatheriness, and then the malty character in this beer has a little bit of everything. You've got the woody, well, that's not really malty, you've got the woody smoothness in there, the well-fired bread crust, the sweet kind of cakey, bready sort of thing, and the, the sweeter brown sugars above that. Malt base is nice. In terms of the IBUs, I think this beer, you'd be lucky if this is about 20 IBUs, but you certainly get a little bit of earthy herbal kind of character out of it oily and sharp and sweet fruits from the hops themselves and then you've got the actual cherries coming in on this one one thing i would say about this beer though that's a little bit interesting is that i don't find the cherries go that far around the edge of the palate what often happens in beers is when you add fruit into it as an adjunct it will suppress the green component of the hops you do get a little bit of the juicy cherries just going around the edges of the palate there but they're not overly prominent i have to say so that's an interesting point about this beer for me I would uh, I would hasten to add but yeah I think we can leave it at that for this one this has been a really interesting beer to take a look at and it certainly has tasted my palate for sure so yeah this one is the Gran Bino a 9% Imperial Stout aged in um, what was it oh Cabot what was it Cabernet Franc barrels that's it uh, aged for a year and then with uh, sour cherries added to it, a lovely, lovely beer, this one. And I guess we found another very cool Canadian brewery that I need to explore a little bit more. So yeah, 9% Imperial Cherry Stout aged in red wine barrels. I think this was very good. So yeah, once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Burdock Brewery as well. And we will see about making a return to these guys at some point in the future. And I do hope I can get to Toronto and actually visit some of these breweries, maybe do some interviews and uh, uh, just try more of the beers, actually, and discover new breweries that I didn't know. But yeah, the Grand Bino, a 9% uh, Imperial Stout with sour cherries and then aged in uh, red wine barrels. Really interesting stuff and a very nice introduction to Burdock Brewery. So check out my social media, check out Burdock Brewery social media. And I will see you guys in another review. Slange it, skull, cheers, and see you guys very, very soon.